All right, it's question show time. Your questions, my answers. First, I want to take back everything I said about January. We're now going through a heat wave, and I don't like it. So, but I know my wife does. So um, anyway, let's get on with the questions. As always, uh, wherever you are on my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just put it into the comments of the, of the video that you're watching, and I will gather them up, and I'll answer them here. Reno Simpson. Just remember, it's a bit of a trick, i.e. all CGI, still none CGI of Earth. You'd think that that would be the first. Nope, not saying it's flat, just calling NASA on their obvious scam. So one of the things that I get a lot of questions from for people, and it's clearly like some kind of meme that's going around the flat earth community or something. It was like, how come there's no full CGI picture, or sorry, how come there's no full real photograph of earth that's taken from space, it's just the whole globe? And the answer of course is that there's a million of them. Uh, but there's three spacecraft that I wanna point you towards that will probably solve what you're looking for. So the first one is called the Discover Satellite, and this is a spacecraft that was launched by NASA, and it sort of positioned in a location where it has a really nice full view of planet Earth all the time, and so you can see pictures, and go ahead, like you can compare the current weather systems to the weather systems you're experiencing, sort of see that it's the same. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's not live, but it's, you know, updated multiple times a day. Now you probably don't trust NASA, Okay, uh, so here is a very similar spacecraft. It's a weather satellite from Russia, you know, the enemy of the United States. Um, and uh, this weather system is called Electro, uh, has got 15 million images on their website and they're producing tons of images. You can go back and forth through an entire day and sort of see what the weather patterns looked like. All right, but still, you think that the United States and Russia are in some kind of conspiracy? No problem. Here is a new picture that was just released by the Chinese of, of the entire Earth. And this sort of mimicked the Earthrise picture. Uh, this was a new satellite that was just launched a couple of weeks ago, and it's going to be going to pass the far side of the moon and act as a communications relay for uh, a rover that they're sending to the far side of the moon. So China, so China, Russia, United States, all in some kind of vast conspiracy. Or maybe here's a bunch of really cool full images of the earth taken in almost real time, all the time that you can go and look at anytime you want. Frank Tippin. Could we design a JWST type telescope that launches up to near earth orbit but has astronauts attach or unfold the mirrors that are boosted carefully into its final position? So I talked about the Louvoir telescope a couple of episodes back, and actually one idea that would be for Louvoir would actually be a gigantic space telescope that would be attached to the Deep Space Gateway, which is going to be in this lunar orbit. And it's exactly what you would say. So the, they would launch up the parts, the astronauts would assemble it, and it would be sort of close by or actually attached to the Deep Space Gateway. And that would be one of the purposes for astronauts to go up to the Deep Space Gateway would be, would be to service this gigantic telescope that's attached up there in space. So it's not a terrible idea. It's one that NASA is considering and we're still gonna sort of see how everything shakes out. Gravel Pit. Is it conceivable with current propulsion technology to ever catch up to Voyager and accompany it on its way or even recover it and bring it home? Right now, the Voyager spacecraft are going about 17 kilometers per second, which is a couple of kilometers faster than the escape velocity from the solar system. So the Voyagers are going and they're never coming back. So could you catch up with those spacecraft? Sure. You would have to build a more powerful rocket than the one that launched the Voyagers. You would have to do gravitational assists off maybe Jupiter and Saturn and get into a very similar trajectory and catch up with them. It would probably take decades maybe 100 years to do. Now, once you had caught up with them, you would then have to cancel out that 17 kilometers per second of velocity, which would be very difficult to do, and then you would have to bring them back. So really, feasibly, no. It's, there's no way that we could ever catch them or bring them back. And they're gonna go radio silent in just a decade or so, and then we wouldn't even be able to find them. So. They're gone, they're our gift to the Milky Way, and uh, I hope the aliens enjoy them. Oh fudge, could Jupiter be used as a gravity lens? Man, that is a great question, and I'll get to the answer in a second. But So this idea of a gravity lens, right, there's this thinking, this calculation that goes, if you take a telescope out to about 1,000 
AUs, astronomical units, so the distance from the Earth to the Sun, out away from the Sun, and you set up this telescope, this, the gravity of the Sun would act as a natural lens, a telescope lens, would create this Einstein ring around it. And so if you use the coronagraph, which we talked about, and you block the light from the Sun, you would be able to see these this magnified object in this sort of lens around the sun and then you could sort of take that lens and you could reverse engineer it and you could have a telescope that would let you see surface features on planets orbiting other stars. Now I see what you're thinking which is like well could we go to Jupiter? Jupiter's smaller, easier to get to, maybe practice the techniques there and then you know go a more distant location to do the you know the full operation. But the reality is you can't. The gravity is what creates the gravitational lens. The stronger the gravity, the sort of shorter, the closer you have to be or can be to actually capture the images. So actually Jupiter with its lower gravity than the Sun would mean that you would have to be significantly farther away than if you were going to use the Sun. Like much, much, much farther. I haven't done the exact calculation, but you'd have to be so much farther. So in fact, Using the Sun as a gravitational lens is a lot easier than using Jupiter as a gravitational lens because the Sun's gravity is much stronger. The ideal situation would be to have, say, a black hole nearby or a neutron star. That would be, you could be even closer. Um, but so unfortunately, Jupiter will not make a good gravitational lens as a powerful telescope. Fugal. Has the planetary dust storm on Mars killed the rovers then? Not yet. Uh, well, the Spirit's dead. And Curiosity is going to be fine because it has a, an, an RTG, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is a chunk of decaying plutonium. But Opportunity is the one that is at risk. And we won't know if Opportunity is going to survive this storm for a couple of weeks until this gigantic dust storm wraps up. And it is a big, very darkened dust storm, the most significant, most powerful dust storm that has really been witnessed in modern history on the surface of Mars. So, Opportunity is in for a pretty rough ride. Obviously, the folks at NASA are hopeful. They've built the probe. They've managed its batteries very carefully. It's got other ways of keeping itself warm. And hope is that the dust storm will wrap up in time, that Opportunity can you know, dust itself off and continue its operations just like normal. But it's entirely possible that this will be the end of Opportunity, just like it was the end of Spirit. Evolution Inc. If you made a YouTube Red documentary series, I think I'd be the only thing I'd happily pay for. Aw, thanks. Um, I just got YouTube Red here in Canada. I feel like I'm no longer a second class citizen. I can like watch videos without advertisements and I can download videos and I can listen to music and all the good stuff that Americans have enjoyed. So, uh, but yeah, YouTube Red. YouTube, if you're listening, I would be glad to do a YouTube Red. It would be great. I do a really good job. So if you're at YouTube or you have friends who know how to get YouTube Red shows done, pass my name along. Diego Faria. Born too late to explore this world, born too soon to explore the galaxy. Depressing. Oh man, you're not born too late to explore this world and you're not born too early to explore the galaxy. I love to explore my surroundings. I live on Vancouver Island, which is a fairly big place, and I've only explored a fraction of the island. And one of the happiest things that I like to do is I get my GPS, I start up a GPS track, and then I just go to places, trails, roads, streets, mountains, places I know I've never been, and I find amazing new things all the time. And we're never gonna find a place that was in, that's within you know, reasonably close area that is anywhere as interesting as planet Earth, right? We've got mountains and forests and lakes and rivers and oceans and, and ice caps and the Arctic regions and different kinds of animals and plants and, and insects and all kinds of stuff. So this planet itself needs tons of exploring. And even if you're not the first person to climb Mount Everest, these things will be new to you. So get out there and explore the planet. There's so much to do. And, uh, and you'd be amazed how much fun you have as you just get out there and go places that you've never been. Same time though, I think you're going to see the technology for exploring the solar system is rapidly advancing. And so depending, you know, I think it's going to happen within my lifetime and I'm an old man. So uh, I'm sure you'll be able to explore if you want. But I think, you know, once you get out into the solar system, you got comets, right? you got balls of ice, you've got uh, 
asteroids, which are chunks of rock, and then you've got the moon, which is rock with more rock and powdered rock, and then you've got Mars, which is, you know, rock and dust and sand and more rock. So, so Earth should be able to keep it pretty busy. And don't worry too much about what's out there in space. Let robots do a lot of that exploring. That's my opinion anyway. Mr. Glick Click. It's amazing how ignorant the layperson is on space travel. There are people so happy about colonizing Mars without knowing about the cosmic radiation that goes unchecked because of the lack of magnetic fields that the Earth has. I think there's two parts to this, right? There's the kind of people who wonder at the possibilities of some other world and were maybe raised with science fiction and they think that Mars is going to be like you know, it's going to be like a desert, it's going to be like Dune, or maybe it's going to be like, you know, some other TV show or movie that they've seen. And of course, the reality is, is that Mars is going to be brutal and really hard to live on. And the radiation is going to be constant and death is around every corner for now. Later on, it, it should get safer and safer and safer. But for now, being one of the people who explores space is an incredibly dangerous thing. That said, there are certain kinds of people who all they want to do is challenge themselves. All they want to do is go and see if they have what's in, what it takes to live on a world like Mars or like the moon and they understand the risks and they're willing to take them and they thrive in that kind of challenge. And who am I to say that that's a, that person is overly naive. They're the people who explored a lot of the places here on Earth. They're the people who, who push out and try new things and are willing to kind of push their bodies and endanger themselves. You know, people die climbing, climbing Mount Everest. I wouldn't do that, right? But, but there are people who the, that risk is willing, you know, they're willing to take that risk to be able to experience and overcome the challenge of climbing Mount Everest. So this world needs both kinds of people. Rob Nijkamp. So when nebulae meet, stars are being born by mostly hydrogen colliding. When there's enough hydrogen and pressure, the star ignites and hydrogen fusion can begin. The rest of the gas is blown out and they will start to form planets. There's a tipping point where hydrogen starts to fuse. So why are there different sizes of stars? The size of a star, the mass of a star is limited by the amount of star forming material that it can get its hands on uh, in the star forming nebula. So imagine like a big star forming nebula, right? You've got a big cloud of gas and then various parts of it start to combine down and kind of tear off and start to form into these pockets where these stars are going to be formed. And really, if you have a small amount of gas, then you're going to get, say, a brown dwarf. If you have more, you're going to get a red dwarf. Then you're going to get a main sequence star. And if you have like a lot, you're going to get a, you know, a super massive star. Now, the limit is essentially a couple of hundred times the mass of the sun. About 300, I think, is the most massive star that's been seen. When you hit that level, the, as the gas is coming in, it starts to generate these really powerful solar winds that are so strong that it sort of blows out any further gas from being able to, to arrive onto the star. But really, that's the limit. So the size of the star just depends on the amount of material that it has to work with in the beginning. And the limit is sort of the ultimate limit is is when the star blows out that material at about 300 times the mass of the sun. Daffy David. So the universe became self-aware when intelligent life began and formed the capacity to recognize itself, and then the universe will die when it is no longer self-aware when the last star blinks out. I really like that, that quote from Carl Sagan, you know, that life is the universe understanding itself. I, I'm kind of mangled it, I'm sure, but that's the gist, right? And that, that the, before life and before intelligent life, the universe was just molecules organizing and reorganizing itself in different ways under natural processes. And now there is living creatures which can study it and understand it and seek wisdom from it and, and reflect on its nature and philosophize. And, and I love all this, right? Uh, are we the only ones who've been here? We don't know. Are we the first? We don't know. Or will we be the last? We don't know. But someone had to be first and someone had to be last. Uh, someone will be last uh, into the future of the universe. Of course, the universe was here before the first people were here to see it. And of course, the universe will be here long after the last civilization is here to understand it and probably forever, infinity, it will just keep on going, expanding and accelerating and cooling down. So let's enjoy our time while we have it.
Matteo Sporetto. Hey Fraser, you talked about light pollution some QAs ago, mentioning a site where there was a map of the pollution. Could you do it again? I can't remember. It's called the Dark Sky Finder. So it overlays light pollution map with a Google map so you can really kind of zoom in and see. And I like anywhere above blue is acceptable for, for being able to see the Milky Way. And wherever you are, if you're in New York City, if you're in Washington DC, you should be able to get to a place where you can see the Milky Way and really nice meteor showers within a couple of hour drive, Europe even. Um, so it's worth going to. So Dark Sky Finder, user McUserface. I have a question regarding the speed at which stuff happens in our universe, which if I'm understanding things correctly is at the speed of light. So pretending this is physically possible, if I have a poking stick that measures one light year in length and I use that poking stick to flip a light switch for a really, really bright light that's one light year away, do I see the light from where I'm standing after one year or two? In other words, does the poke travel down the poking stick like a ripple at the speed of light? Or does the entire poking stick move across space in unison with my poking action? Thanks for all you do. I learn a lot from your channel. So the speed of light is what's called the speed of causality. And so yeah, your poking stick cannot move faster than the speed of light. So if you send a poking signal from with your hand, the you know, that motion will move down the stick as long as it, you know, was perfect, you know, there was sort of, it wasn't kind of, wouldn't flex back and forth at the speed of light or just shy of the speed of light. Uh, and then it would flick your light switch and then the light would take a year to get back to you. So it would be sort of in an ideal situation, just a little bit over two years for that to happen. But of course, you know, what's going to really happen is the, the molecules are going to bump together and sort of a maximum speed that that can happen. But in general, that is the speed of causality and you can't break it. All right, that's it. Another question show. Uh, so as always, I really enjoy this wherever you are on my channel. If a question pops into your brain, just type it down. I'll gather a bunch of them up and I'll answer them here. All right, we'll see you next week.